Welcome back, everybody, to the 2018 EVH webinars. Uh, it's our pleasure and honor to have with us again uh, naturopathic physician Gregory Pace with us. Um, he's going to talk about Hahnemann's advanced methods and posology as we all are doing or, or will be doing. And so Gregory, Gregory has enough time and so he gets home before the snow accumulates too much there in Colorado. I will turn it over to Gregory. Hi, everybody. Happy New Year. I was telling uh, uh, Dr. Jeff and, and, and Dr. Beal that I uh, decided to drive back to town from my office in a pretty mild snowstorm for the Colorado mountains, just to be sure that we had a good connection this evening because I'm really excited to talk about this topic. This is one of my favorite areas to talk about, to share with other practitioners and to teach when I had the, the chance. So uh, this is what we're going to be uh, focusing on today. Um, perhaps a, a little bit about me might be helpful for those of you who weren't at the attending the webinar I did for the AVH back in October. I'm a registered naturopathic doctor in the state of Colorado. I've been in practice since 1993, first in actually Fort Collins, Colorado, then in Pennsylvania for almost 17 years, and then we returned back to Colorado a little bit over three years ago. My focus from when I was in naturopathic school and then uh, as soon as I started practice uh, has been uh, homeopathy was my main uh, uh, approach that I wanted to use with my patients. Uh, it, it was what I knew that I wanted to do uh, in addition to uh, the other naturopathic modalities, nutrition, et cetera. I had the opportunity, especially in Pennsylvania, to work both with our animals on our little farmette uh, as well as all my uh, human patients. Uh, and I found that doing both uh, actually help the other. Uh, working with animals and not having them be able to talk to me in words uh, made me um, uh, expand uh, and at the same time focus uh, my awareness and how I uh, worked with patients. And then taking some of that ability to work with my human patients, babies, toddlers, infants. So there was a nice uh, cross uh, pollination, so to speak, back and forth with doing that. Here are the objectives, uh, the topics that I want to cover tonight. Uh, it, it will be in brief uh, due to the time that we have, but uh, we will get to all of these um, as we go through the, the, the different steps here, as well as the, um, you know, the, the cases that I'm going to be uh, talking about. As I go along, please raise your hand if you have questions, and I will also be taking uh, a, a couple of breaks uh, where I'll be asking for questions at different points where I, I feel it's uh, probably useful to do so. So what I mean by Hahnemann's advanced methods uh, is the context of what he wrote in the fifth and sixth organons, uh, being that those were published, uh, you know, the fifth edition in 1833, and then the sixth edition of the Organon, uh, at least the, American, the English edition was published in 1921. We're going to be talking about the medicinal solution, how to administer it, how to modify it, why that might be useful to know how to do that, how that a references to individualizing the dose, uh, each individual dose. And, and then, as I mentioned, uh, I think we have three case examples we're going to go through. So case number one is about Tasha. Uh, for almost 17 years, we ran a fiber business. Mostly my wife ran a fiber business 
on our little 14 acre farm at in North Central Pennsylvania. We had a herd of Sounds like we may have lost Gregory's audio. Can anyone else hear me? I can Hello? hear you, Jeff. It's Susan, I can hear you, but I can't hear Gregory. Yeah, Craig, 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 can you hear me? Let me try messaging him. Sorry, everyone. I trust he's got his cell phone and I'm going to text him. Okay, great. Hope everything's okay. You don't get him back, you have to sing, Jeff. Well, I was going to say we can uh, go through a couple of cases of our own. But hopefully. Gregory is still there. Be back in a minute. Oh, good. <laughs> Just got a test a text from from Gregory that said it should be good now. Um. I'm asking him if he's talking. Yeah, no, it says he's offline, so he may have to actually uh, disconnect and reconnect. Well, sorry, I'm sorry everyone. I'm, I'm transferring. Uh, um, I'm transferring this to him. Start for the slow start to 2018. Um, we will finish all the all the material, uh, even if we have to run over, and we'll get Gregory back momentarily. He's going to but, try and call in. Um, yep, that'd be great. Though actually, if it says offline, it means slides may not work. Uh, are you still looking at the case one Tasha slide? Yeah, uh, you may want to say to him the best thing would be to probably just quit go to webinar and reconnect.
I'm just curious while we're waiting for Gregory to get back on board. If if those of you and I can't see who's here and and who's not here because my um, control panel only shows me who the panelists are, not who all the attendees are. But I'm just curious if uh, the folks that are out there, who I'm not sure who you all are. Um, here I am. If, hey, gang. Hey, gang. I'm there. We you. go. You're back. All right. So I don't know. Go to webinar, Jinx. All I can say because my connection's fine on this end. So uh, can we still see my screen or is that gone as well? Well, we, we, we see your screen, but you're, you're not connected to the webinar except by phone. So you okay. may not be able to advance your slides. So you may need to quit, go to webinar, relaunch, but you can um, try. Right. So try let, me, I'm gonna, well, um, let me just do it a simple way. I'm gonna uh, change my slides. So did you see a change? No. Nope. Okay. All right. Then I will. So you can actually, Gregory, if you stay on the phone and quit yep. go to webinar, you should be able to maintain a phone conversation with us while the other electronic stuff starts. So if you can, if you can walk and chew gum at the same time, you can actually talk while the while the whole go to webinar thing is reloading for you. Okay. Been there, sure. been there, done that. Yep. Yep. So, all right. I quit go to webinar and I'm going to uh, start it up again. But I, yeah. It, so that's not going to work. So it, it's not, yeah. I yeah, think you have I to... know what happened. I think, I, I think we, there must have been some kind of electrical problem in the building so there's no uh, my network is now saying that there's no connection okay so so, so I'm sure you can present this material without your slides well you can you can present it and we'll just imagine the slides that's right that sounds good <laughs> uh, I'm thinking if there's any other option probably not, not okay right now. not right now so um, let me, ch you know, let me see, I don't know if there's a breaker that I can flip, but let me see if there's something like that that might affect the locally. I, I think it's the whole building, but let me, I'll be back in uh, less than a minute. So while Gregory's gone, I just, I'll just ask my question of since the last time that we were together in October talking about this subject, I just wondered if anybody who hadn't previously looked at uh, dosing out of medicinal solution had had started to use this, or anybody had sort of changed their relationship with posology um, based on the discussion that we've we've had before. You know, if we were if we were dosing out of the medicinal solution, but not doing any transfers to other cups, or uh, you know, dosing but waiting, and uh, you know, uh, that sort of stuff. I'm I'm really curious about what people's clinical experience has been. And and I think Jeff can look at the hand yep, raising. Yep, jo Joelette has her hand raised, but she's not connected to audio right now. Okay. So, uh, Joelette, if you can hear us, you can just type your your question or comment in in the chat. Okay, I'm back, and the word is we don't have um, um, we don't have the power for the for the network for the whole building. So cool. Maybe I should have stayed home. <laughs> 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 I was so happy that I drove to town. All right. So then we're good. <laughs> so then um, uh, I'm going to just jump right back into my first case. If that's all right with everybody. That'd be great. Yep. Sorry. Okay. All right. So I was uh, describing uh, talking about Tasha who's our Marana guardian dog for our herd, uh, well, at least in Pennsylvania, we had a herd of Nubian and Angora goats. Once we moved back to Colorado, uh, we brought a few Nubians with us, just a couple of the Angoras, and then, of course, Tasha. In the summer of 2016, uh, a Sunday afternoon, of course, uh, uh, my wife, Phil, came into my office and she was very upset. Tasha was exhibiting the same behavior 
that patches one of our previous Maremmas had exhibited when she died from bloat. The way Phil described it, it was as if Tasha was belching, but it wasn't like all the way complete. Uh, she said the sound was something uh, between a belch and a bark. Uh, Phil was really concerned as this was the very same symptom that Patches had exhibited before she passed. Uh, at this point, uh, we, we didn't have a relationship with a veterinarian and uh, transit time to get to anywhere that was open on a Sunday afternoon was one to two hours, depending on what the emergency on-call availability was. I asked Phil to give me any other symptoms that she had seen um, as I was, you know, quickly uh, just uh, looking at a couple of uh, rubrics, and, and she said that uh, uh, Tasha was walking around, uh, you know, just kind of uh, distressed, uh, and that she was drinking a lot of water, uh, much more than she had been in the previous days. I went out to the barn to uh, observe and to see what I could. As deep chested and as furry as she was, I really couldn't confirm to my own uh, self that her stomach was enlarged. But really, even before I went to touch her, uh, she was walking up against me, pushing up against me, actually practically, she almost did knock me over, big dog, uh, to be petted. And once I started petting her, she wanted to be petted a lot, uh, more than had ever been true in her whole life up to that point in time. I mean, we had a good relationship. She liked me, but this was a dramatic change in her behavior up to this point. So what I had was the ineffectual belching, uh, the large increase in drinking water, and especially her strong desire to be rubbed. All within the perspective of you know, uh, having seen a, a, another Maroma go through something like this, at least the, you know, had the belching part um, and, and what had happened to her. Uh, and so that, that's what I was thinking about was bloat. And the symptoms led me to decide on phosphorus. So I took one pellet of phosphorus 200C, dissolved it in four ounces of water, and uh, decided that before each dose, I would succuss this medicinal solution 10 times. And over the course of that day, um, uh, that, that was that Sunday, uh, and the next, she received three separate doses of phosphorus 200C in water. By the next day, uh, after that third dose, uh, uh, she was about 80% recovered. And throughout the time of the first and second doses, uh, there were changes in her behavior that led me to believe that she was responding uh, to the remedy, uh, not the least of which was after the first dose, the frequency and intensity of the belching uh, was greatly uh, reduced uh, after that first dose. So why this method of dosing? Uh, because this case is, is really not to talk about the remedy and the condition, though of course I was absolutely thrilled, uh, and it's one of my uh, uh, favorite cases to talk about animal-wise um, because of the nature of the, the seriousness of the condition I thought she had, uh, as well as um, the, her response to the, to the remedy that I gave her. So really this is mostly about the dosing and um, why we do it that way. And I have this great, uh, it's one of my favorite <laughs> pictures. Uh, I won't talk too, many, too much about pictures that you guys can't see, but uh, it's a sine wave. Uh, and as you're at the top of the sine wave, there's a happy face with a smile. And as you get to the, 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 the horizontal line uh, where the, the sine wave is going down about halfway, uh, that, that face just has a straight, it's not happy or sad. And then you get down to the bottom 
uh, in other words, the trough uh, below that horizontal line, and we've got a sad face. Okay? And then as you go up, again, at the horizontal line, it's a um, uh, face neither happy nor sad. And then at that top, um, uh, it's a happy face again. Basically, uh, this is a, what I think of as a representation of the uh, method of dosing that I was taught in naturopathic college, which was uh, to dose once and wait, and wait for that complete relapse of symptoms before dosing again. And that dosing was dry, dry pellets, uh, and given, uh, you know, it was open-ended, but typically said, you know, you, you could dose, you know, a few pellets at a time. Uh, so that dry dose, indistinct number of pellets, only repeated at relapse of symptoms, is straight out of the organon, uh, but it's from the fourth edition of the organon which was published in 1829, right? And it's aphorism 242 that says, as long as there is progressive improvement that continues from the medicine that's administered, you basically have to let the duration of action go until um, you see the, you know, the, the relapse of symptoms. And hence, all repetition of any dose of medicine is forbidden. This is what um, I was taught as the wait and watch method. And up to 1829, that was Hahnemann's experience. So that's what he wrote in the Organon, and that's how uh, he himself practiced. Essentially that, um, you know, if you saw an improvement after the administration of that first dose of the remedy, then further repetitions of the dose were contraindicated that only when there was a clear relapse of symptoms could a second dose of the remedy be administered. And at this, at this point in time, the fourth edition, he was using um, uh, dry pellets uh, to administer remedies. Uh, now we can go all the way forward to the sixth edition, right? And in aphorism 246, He's still saying that there, you know, as long as there's a marked, obviously progressing improvement during treatment, no more medicine of any kind must be given uh, because all the good that the medicine taken can accomplish is speeding towards its completion. And he says that this is not infrequently the case with acute diseases, but that especially with chronic diseases, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, that the single dose of the appropriately chosen homeopathic medicine does sometimes complete that, the good that the remedy can, but that it it's, can be too slow over the period of 40, 50, 60, or 100 days. And, and what he writes about is that, you, you know, that it would be uh, helpful to the physician important to the patient as well to reduce this period of time by as much as possible, half or three quarters or more, so as to obtain a far more rapid cure. And to do this process, to, to see this accomplished, and again, we're still in aphorism 246, first, the medicine is very carefully selected, so that is, it is accurately homeopathic. And I didn't have much to go on with my prescription of phosphorus for Tasha, but the symptoms that I chose were characteristic and intense. So in, in the moment of that prescription, uh, it was the best uh, medicine that I saw. Secondly, he says, and again, 246, uh, to accomplish this result, that medicine needs to be potentized, dissolved in water, and given in small doses at intervals that experience is shown to be the most appropriate to the speediest possible cure. So here, you know, we have a, 
a, a big change from the fourth edition to the sixth edition. And that he's taken that pellet of the remedy and dissolving it in water and then giving doses from that medicinal solution at the intervals that experience shows you to be most appropriate for the speediest cure. But you have to change the potency before you give a following dose. The way he describes it, the degree of potency of each dose must be somewhat different from that of the previous, so that the vital principle is never roused and incited to untoward reaction, which is what always happens, his words, always happens when unmodified doses are repeated, especially at short intervals. So to you know, prevent untoward reactions, you really want to be modifying your dose each time you give it. The first dose as well as every following dose by succussion. He goes on to say in aphorism 247, it's inadmissible to repeat even once, let alone many times, exactly the same dose of medicine without modifying it. In other words, he's saying that what he used to do in uh, up to the fourth edition, up to 1829, is no longer admissible to just give um, a remedy uh, in dry form without modifying that dose. I'm not going to read the whole um, uh, aphorism here, but I I'd encourage you to follow and look at it yourselves. Uh, this is 247 from the sixth edition. Just the, the, the first sentence uh, uh, in the second paragraph, the vital principle does not accept such identical doses, in other words, those dry repeated doses, without opposition. In other words, without bringing out other symptoms in the medicine, symptoms not similar to those of the disease being treated. He goes on to say, uh, now we're, we're switching gears a little bit here, uh, we're back to the fifth edition of the Organon, aphorism 286, where he says that the effect of a homeopathic dose of medicine increases the greater the quantity of fluid in which it is dissolved when administered to the patient, although the actual amount of medicine it contains remains the same. This is the medicinal solution. This is why we dissolve, why I dissolve that pellet of phosphorus 200C in four ounces of water in a bottle and then dosed from that medicinal solution. I found over the years, and I've been doing this pretty much since my start in practice, so close to 25 years, that um, on occasion, like I've done it less than five times in 25 years, I've needed to start with a, a larger amount of medicinal solution, start with eight ounces rather than four, but I find that four is, for a number of different reasons, works really well. And I'm you know, originally basing my approach in what he says here, that you're, you're not um, uh, somehow uh, lessening the effect of the remedy, even though the, 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 you know, you're putting it in water and dissolving it. That from his experience, and, and it certainly is, you know, my experience definitely matches Hahnemann's, um, that um, in doing this, uh, the, the medicine has a, a great effect and that it is not diluted. Uh, but again, you, you know, you have to have your homeopathically chosen remedy uh, to see these effects. Staying in the fifth edition of the Organon for another aphorism here, uh, in 287, he talks about the effect of succussing the medicinal solution each time before taking a dose. What he says is, with two, three, ten, and more such strokes, this mixture becomes much more intimate. That is to say, the medicinal power becomes much more potentized, and the spirit of the medicine, so to speak, becomes more unfolded, developed, and rendered, much more penetrating in its action on the nerves. And I could spend a, several minutes here talking about uh, 
different um, uh, successions, one time, two times, three times, five times, ten times. Um, there's different reasons why I choose uh, 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 and instruct patients to succuss their medicinal solutions, uh, uh, different uh, amounts. But with uh, Tasha, in this particular instance, uh, I, I did choose 10 times. Now back to the sixth edition uh, in aphorism 246, he says the degree of potency of each dose must be somewhat different from that of the previous and that of the following. So that the vital principle, which is to be diverted to a similar medicinal disease, is never roused and excited to untoward reactions, as always happens when unmodified doses are repeated, especially at short intervals. So again, this idea we're trying to prevent untoward reactions. And another way of doing that, uh, besides administering the medicinal solution, is to succuss uh, before each dose. I had more here to, to talk about that, but we, we lost a bit of time, so I'm going to go on, hopefully get in, in one more case here. So with the medicinal solution, and that is the, the four ounces with the one pellet dissolved in it, there are several different ways that you can modify the dose. You can change the amount that's dosed. In uh, Tasha's instance, I, we, we gave her one teaspoon. Uh, each of those three times she was dosed. We kept the number of succussions the same for each dose, and that was 10 times. We did not further uh, put uh, the remedy in uh, additional uh, four ounces of water, uh, which I call dosing from a glass. Uh, we're going to talk about that in another case here. Uh, I, I didn't change the actual potency. Uh, uh, other than each time uh, you succuss the remedy, you are slightly changing the potency. In this instance, uh, I didn't uh, modify the frequency of dosing. I was basing it on her response. Uh, I didn't uh, change the number of pellets dissolved in solution. Uh, I just dissolved one, and I gave her a teaspoon each time. But that's two, four, six, seven different ways. The amount, the succussions from a glass, the uh, increase in potency from succussion, the frequency of dosing, the number of pellets you dissolve in the solution, and the volume of solution. All those different modifications uh, that you can do with the medicinal solution. And for the most part, obviously you can't do with dry dosing pellets. So we're going to move on here to case number three, uh, because this is a case where uh, I do end up uh, dosing from uh, uh, an additional solution. And I want to describe this here before we finish up for the evening. So this uh, case is uh, uh, patient uh, BM who sought out homeopathic care because of the symptoms he'd been experiencing ever since the diagnosis of Lyme disease two years ago. When I saw him, these symptoms were exquisite skin tenderness of the right breast, winging of the right scapula, much gas and bloating, weakness of the knees, and problems achieving an erection. All these symptoms had came on um, after uh, uh, receiving that diagnosis of Lyme disease. After working up this case, to me, it was a clear picture of lycopodium. Initially, I had him take lycopodium. Uh, uh, there was, uh, I had him dissolve one pellet and four ounces of water in a bottle, uh, one teaspoon directly from that solution with five succussions before each dose. His first month follow-up, the knee weakness was gone. The skin tenderness was much better about 80%, and the sugar winging had lessened, um, but only to a small degree. And he was quite happy with that result overall, but when I went through the other uh, symptoms, uh, just asking him uh, about general symptoms, uh, 
he proceeded to tell me that whenever his, he dosed, his sleep would be disrupted. His legs would be restless in bed and it would be difficult for him to fall asleep. Now, in all the email follow-up between his first visit and this, his first uh, in-person follow-up, uh, all the email contacts we had, he never mentioned that he was having this problem. He was used to conventional drugs, uh, you know, uh, helping perhaps one symptom, uh, usually not several, but helping one symptom, and then making other symptoms worse. So in, in his mind, uh, it, it wasn't something he needed to tell me. For me, of course, uh, I was not happy uh, with the fact that the uh, dosing he had been doing um, had uh, disrupted his sleep in this way. So even though he was happy with his progress, I let him know that I didn't want there to be an aggravation every time he dosed. Given that he wanted, that he uh, lived in the uh, Northeast, uh, 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 farther distance from me than my local patients, uh, rather than sending him uh, perhaps a Q potency, uh, in the mail, which I could have, um, I wanted to have him try something sooner. So what I did was is I gave him instructions to dose the Lycopodium 30C from the first glass. And I'll describe that briefly uh, so you know what I mean by that. Uh, so what, you, what I have patients do is they take one pellet of their remedy, in his case, Lycopodium 30C. They dissolve that in four ounces of water in a bottle. They succuss that, uh, in his case, five succussions. And then they take one teaspoon from that bottle and they put it into a glass with four ounces of water. I call that the first glass. And I have them stir that solution. And then they take one teaspoon from that first glass as their dose. I found that uh, my experience, again, matches Hahnemann, that when uh, you extend, now he did this with Q potencies, but I find it works well with centesimal potencies, uh, that when you extend uh, the dose like this, uh, in other words, first glass, second glass, et cetera, uh, that it can have, uh, assuming that it's the correct remedy, that the aggravation of symptoms will decrease uh, and almost uh, always go away. Uh, and he continued, you know, and the patient will continue to have the positive effects from the remedy. Uh, and that was true in BM's case. Uh, once I had him dosing from the first glass, he no longer had the sleep aggravation and, and his other symptoms continued to resolve. The winging of the shoulder, the exquisite sensitivity of the skin, et cetera. So that this is one of my go-to method uh, uh, modifications that I use for sensitive individuals is to have them dose from a glass. Um, this is not, I'm going to emphasize, this is not unique to my practice by any means. Uh, this is uh, driven by what Hahnemann uh, described in the organon and other uh, practitioners use this method as well. Um, I've never gone beyond, needed to go beyond the, the fourth glass uh, with my patients but I have colleagues who have gone to six glasses and eight glasses uh, in their clinical practice. I had another uh, case uh, that I'm gonna try and squeeze here in here, but it's gonna be, um, I'm gonna apologize ahead of time, it's gonna be somewhat uh, concentrated here in terms of my description. When I first saw KV, a uh, 39-year-old woman, her chief complaints were swallowing problems, anxiety, and digestive issues. A friend of hers who was a professional homeopath gave her carcinosin 1M and told her to take four pellets per day for seven days and, and then wait and come back in five weeks. For about seven to 10 days after these doses, uh, uh, KV was, uh, experiencing a, an extreme amount of anxiety and not sleeping well. Her physical symptoms had increased. She had a harder time swallowing liquids 
and felt her digestion was off almost all the time. She called me to see what else I might do for her. When I responded that I would treat her homeopathically, she was very resistant. And those of you that have heard me uh, uh, describe some of my other cases in other webinars, th this is a common theme that I found. Folks getting dry doses of high potency remedies uh, without any consideration of individualization and then told to wait and come back in you know, several weeks time. Uh, and that was what she had been told. Uh, so she didn't want to go through that again because she had been worse without any improvement. I explained to her that I would use acute potency in medicinal solution and be able to modify the dose so that if there was any kind of aggravation of symptoms, uh, we'd be able to change that with uh, using those tools. So I, I took her case and I did come up with the same remedy, carcinosin. But I gave her carcinosin Q1 in four ounces of water, one measured teaspoon, five succussions. But I only had her, I only gave her one dose to start because I already knew that she was sensitive and I didn't want to leave, you know, have her just continue without some sort of feedback so I knew what was going on. So about two days after starting the carcinosin, she developed a little bit of a sore throat and didn't feel good for that day. It came on suddenly and left suddenly, or probably over the course of a couple of hours, without doing anything else, without using any other treatments. I just had her leave that alone. And so from that point on, she improved without any further sort of reaction. And based on the level of anxiety that she had from month to month, the intensity of her swallowing problems with liquid, and what she described as her overall sense of well-being, we managed her case with carcinosin in Q1 potency without any further aggravation. So that the two major changes that I made from what she had experienced before were that I used acute potency and I had a dose with a medicinal solution. My opinion is that both were a very important factor in her improvement, uh, given that you know, she had the same remedy that had aggravated her so much before. It's my experience over and over and over again that uh, patients that come to me previously haven't been given a, a good remedy choice, but typically uh, dry pellets, no feedback, uh, just, you know, take a 200C or 1M for however many days and then stop and then come back in however many weeks. You know, I, I've had a number of patients like that. Um, you know, that they experience aggravations, oftentimes uh, pretty strong ones. Right? And they come to me as a naturopathic doctor, not for homeopathy, but for something else that I might do for them naturopathically. And I have to spend some time, uh, uh, some time, a lot of time, uh, convincing that homeopathy is the way to go for their situation. And I'm getting a lot of feedback. Hopefully that's something that somebody can mute on the other end and you guys can still hear me. Um, so the, you know, the changes were acute potency uh, so that uh, we could greatly reduce the possibility of um, a aggravation uh, and dosing with the medicinal solution so that I had the most possible control over how she dosed, and what happened when she dosed. And the, the way I did it, she had a little bit of a uh, sore throat and didn't feel well uh, two days after that first dose. Uh, nothing else uh, changed. Uh, maybe that was coincidence. I don't tend to believe in coincidence when I work with people homeopathically, but perhaps that was. Um, but she uh, did very well, again, uh, with homeopathy, with the same remedy. Uh, but uh, in a Q potency medicinal solution with more active follow up to manage her case so that she didn't aggravate and we didn't lose her uh, to those aggravations. So, the, the takeaways in this condensed version of tonight's webinar that I want you to come away with are one, that individualizing the dose can be almost as important as individualizing the remedy. 
that the wait and watch method with dry pellets and you know, medium to high potencies limits your ability to manage your cases. And in the patients that I've seen, um, makes people not want to do homeopathy. Uh, I've also seen that the repetition of an unchanged dose can lead to unwanted patient reaction. In the beginning of my practice, uh, I still used uh, uh, dry pellets sometimes because that's the way I thought. What I found is that uh, I can repeat the modified dose in the medicinal solution and controlling for amount and succussion and those other five factors I mentioned. And in doing so, uh, lead to a, a gentler effect and more rapid healing because there, there isn't that sine wave of up and down, up and down, up and down. I, I really like the medicinal solution for how much it increases my flexibility in dosing. And I found that you know, the, the fifth and sixth edition of the, uh, of the organon really have guided me uh, on this path over these last 25 years. So if what I've talked about and a little bit of the why I've done it has piqued your interest, as I hope that it has, I want to tell you about a course uh, coming up that I'm teaching later uh, this month. It's called Increase Your Success Rate, Hanumanian Postology and Practical Case Management. I've really been driven to teach this course because I find that 21st century homeopathic practitioners are still not being taught Hanuman's advanced methods from the fifth and sixth editions regarding potency, remedy administration, and follow-up. So you may be stuck as well not knowing how to use Q potencies or centesimal potencies in water. And you may not really understand what's going on when you see an aggravation. Maybe you've had the experience even of being convinced of the accuracy of your homeopathic prescription, but when you've given it, uh, you, you, you haven't been able to successfully give it because the patient uh, won't comply with it due to uh, aggravation. Either they don't come back or they're very resistant uh, to taking the remedy again because they felt so bad uh, the last time they dosed that, that dry pellet. So what we're going to do in this course is we're gonna dive a, a little bit deeper into the fourth, fifth, and sixth editions of the Organon as we review the development of Hahnemann's most successful prescribing techniques. What I want to do is I want to show you how they can be applied pragmatically in your practice today. We'll be taking, uh, looking at cases from my practice in much more depth than we've been able to go through this evening so you can see the thought process from the first prescription all the way through ongoing case management to resolution. What I can tell you is that if you faithfully apply these techniques, you will increase your success rate and you'll help your patients heal. And in this course, what we're going to be covering is Q potency, a little bit about how they're made, but mostly how to administer it and, and when to administer them, centesimal potencies, also in medicinal solution. How I judge when to use which potency scale. That's definitely more art than science in my experience. How to actually cure without, or at least not very much, aggravation uh, of your patient's symptoms. And actually using uh, aggravations to manage uh, the remedy response that you see. And then we are going to spend a fair amount of time in actual case management techniques so that you can facilitate, you know, following up with your patients, you know, how to expedite their communication with you so you know what's going on and you manage their case to the 
you know, to, to get the best result. This is going to be a six hour course, uh, two hours over three Saturdays. Starting January 27th this month, uh, it's going to be 10 to 12 p.m. Mountain Time. And then February 3rd, 10 to 12 p.m. Mountain Time. And then the last class, the third class, February 10th, 2018, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Mountain Time. The course will be recorded, but I highly encourage you, if you decide to register and, and, and be a student, that you do your best to attend live because I find that you get more out of it. There is more give and take. Um, and of course, um, you can ask questions um, as we go, which is obviously not, not able to do that when, if you're just listening to a recording. The cost of the course, the, the early bird is uh, $150. If you pay it by January 15th, it'll be $190 if you register and pay for the course after that. If you are one of the first 50 to register by January 15th, which is this upcoming Monday, uh, not only is it the early bird price of $150, you'll also be invited to join uh, the private Facebook group just for this course, where we're going to be having a, uh, going through and, and working with um, a lot of hands-on interaction, uh, not just myself, but all of us together in this group uh, going over cases and looking at and trying to understand uh, the reason why we uh, work with cases and manage cases uh, the way we do. So if you want to register and pay for the course, uh, this is where it's going to be a little bit difficult uh, since I can't put this up in the screen, but it is pretty simple. If you want to just write it down before, um, uh, the, the early bird is uh, paypal.me forward slash Gregory Pace ND forward slash 150. And I'll spell all that out. The first part is paypal.me, so that's P A Y P A L dot M E forward slash Gregory Pace ND, that's G R E G O R Y P A I S. N is a nation, D is a doctor, forward slash 150. And then if you happen to register after January 15th, it's the exact same uh, link, except instead of 150, it's 190. So it would be paypal.me forward slash Gregory Pace ND forward slash 190. If you want more information about the course or just uh, have other questions, please email me at gpacend at gmail.com. I don't know if uh, there, there are any questions. We have about five minutes at the end here. If anybody else wants to chime in, Dr. Beal or Dr. Feynman, uh, this would be a great time for questions if you have them. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory. Thank you for um working through all your challenges, the, uh, the internet challenges. Yes, we do have a few questions and we can uh, definitely run over it, you know, if we need to. Great. Um, Let's go for it. First question was from Joletta, who asked whether you see an aggravation in practice at the end of the usefulness of a Q potency, and do you then go up to the next Q potency? So let me repeat that to make sure that I have the question right, uh, Chola. Um, it, that I, I think it pertains to uh, going up in potency uh, with either C or Q potencies when I see an aggravation. And that, that isn't the first spot that I have. Um, uh, in fact, if anything, when I see an aggravation, uh, if it's a similar aggravation, in other words, the symptoms the patient presented with that I prescribed the remedy on, then it's, it's an indicator to me that my remedy, uh, mostly that my remedy potency is too high. So uh, if I have given a 200C or a 30C, 
I might move to a Q potency and I would start with a Q1 potency um, because I found that uh, going from a C to a Q in sensitive individuals can help modify and greatly decrease those aggravations. Now, if it's a Q1 that I'm already administering and I'm seeing, uh, again, a, a similar aggravation, then I'm going to choose one of those modification methods I mentioned earlier. I might decrease the number of succussions. I might have them uh, dose from a first glass instead of dosing from the bottle. Uh, but I'll use one of those seven modifications to uh, try to uh, limit and, and hopefully eliminate that aggravation that's happening with that Q1 potency. Hopefully that's the, that's the answer to the question. Um, I think Gilletta was asking about, is it time to continue with the remedy? Not if it aggravates with the first few doses, but if the aggravation is only seen at the end, which yeah. is when, yeah. you know, I think Kahneman said that's yeah. the time to stop dosing altogether. So that's, that's a really uh, interesting question because this makes me think of the comet as, uh, of homeopathy being a medicine of experience. My experience with that in, in all the years that I've dosed Q potencies is that I've only had a patient st stick with me long enough one time to see an aggravation at the end of care, which is indeed what Hahnemann writes about. Uh, what, what has happened in, in almost all the other cases uh, when I've been dosing Q potencies and only Q potencies is that the patient is cured and um, they never actually have an aggravation at the end of time. I, I think that's because um, I, I manage my cases uh, so closely that before they get to the point where they're manifesting the symptoms of the remedy, we've already stopped, you know, I, I've decreased the dosing so much and I've let them ride each dose for an extended period of time that they never get to the point where they're aggravating because they're not dosing very much. That, that's what I think is going on in that instance. Great, great. Any other questions? And, and yep, and Tara was wondering if you used any, um, any of the homeopathy software. I do. Uh, I, uh, uh, I should note that for from 1999 to 2013, I worked for Whole Health Now, which is the company that distributed radar in North America. I no longer work for them, but I still use radar homeopathic software in my practice. I started with McRepertory and Reference Works back in 1990, excuse me, 1988 but I switched to radar in 1999. Great, and if I could ask one question before I forget. Uh, going back to Tasha's case, you mentioned that it's important for, or that you did, discuss the first dose of the, of the remedy. Um, the, the, the first and the succeeding ones, not, not just the first one, but yeah, sometimes I, I, it hasn't happened much, but sometimes patients won't dose that, you know, when they take it from the bottle the first time and I just make sure that they understand that I want them to dose that dose. And if there are succeeding doses, then succeeding doses as well. So to you, it's because the first dose, because you don't want them to think that the next doses don't get succussed. Because what yeah. if you only give what if you only give the one test dose? Right. Yeah. It, it, it's it's to you know it's really to eliminate confusion um, as far as that goes. Um, yep. Yeah. And you know that, that way they get in the habit of uh, succussing each time they take a dose of their remedy. I, f I found I just I've done that from the beginning and it's worked out really well to do it that way. And, and the only reason I bring it up is because, you know, we deal with a lot of super sensitive skin cases and sometimes those 10 or even five succussions are enough to, you know, set off an aggravation that, you know, zero, one or two may not have. So, you know, uh, 
you know, it's, I, yeah, I, I, there are times where I have patients do, uh, excuse me, because the remedy once before they do. Uh, also, Gregory, not. there's times when you don't take the whole you date don't take the whole spoonful for the dose or the whole spoonful into the next cup. Right, and that's really that kind of is diving into the weeds. Uh, I'll leave for I'll leave for my course to do that. Any other questions? Um, that's all I've got, uh, Joel. I just want to confirm that when you uh, just touch it three times, it uses the same number of concussions each time. I did, and there wasn't, you know, there wasn't. I didn't see any reason not to. Um, so, it, you know, once I, I typically don't change the number of concussions when I dose a, a patient. And thus, I have reason to. If I feel that I need to decrease it because at that point they're hypersensitive to that remedy, that to that um, uh, to that administration of, of their dose, then I'll decrease it to try and affect that hypersensitivity at that point in time. And her follow-up to that question is, um, not sure I understand. Uh, I'll read a word for word. It says, but if it was to a different class, then he varies succussions only if sensitive. Right. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand that either, but when I, I typically use the same number of succussions to the bottle, and then when they, if they are making up, say, first glass or succeeding glasses, I'll use the same number of succussions. So, for, for example, if I dosed Tasha from a first glass, which I didn't, but if I had, you know, uh, because you know, I had been uh, succussing her bottle ten times when I took that teaspoon and put it into that first glass. If I had done that, I would have. I mean, obviously, you're not succussing the glass, but I'll stir. You know, I'll stir the glass, and it, I don't. I don't have any set or routine way of doing that. I just stir it. Um, what I think is sufficient to change the potency. Uh, there, I don't. It, it, again, it's more art than science in that instance. Um, and Shelly asks about how long, and I'm again not sure what this, what the question uh, is referring to, how long does this solution keep? Um, oh, so I found that, you know, the medicinal solution, uh, Hahnemann uh, uh, suggests either using uh, alcohol or charcoal suspended in the solution to preserve it. And initially in practice, I used alcohol. When we moved to Pennsylvania, I had enough patients who had a problem with that that I just stopped, um, and charcoal was just too much of a hassle for them. I just stopped have, having them um, you know, do anything to preserve their solution. And I found that good, you know, probably 90% nine, of the time, even in Pennsylvania summers, that the medicinal solution, that four ounces with the remedy dissolved in, it would last three and a half to four weeks before it turned funky. But I would have them stored, you know, in the shade, in a cool place, you know, so it, you know, it, it had the best chance, you know, not to go bad. Um, but every once in a while, probably once or twice a year, I would have somebody have, you know, I would have patients, no matter what they did, their solutions would go bad. And then we would have end up putting a quarter teaspoon of alcohol in a four ounce bottle, and that would solve the problem. But most of the time, you know, three and a half to four weeks, uh, at least in Pennsylvania, which is where I practiced most of my most of my uh, career. Um, and I, I just want to confirm you're referring to if you save the medicinal solution made up from C potencies because we're not reusing the Q potency glass that we, that we make, right? You're I'm not sure what up. your question is, but I, I, I treat Q potencies and C potencies the same when I put them in water. I don't treat them any differently. I treat so them you the same. May, so you make up one dose of the Q potency and use that over and over again to cause the glass? I... I'll take one, let's say that case I mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, carcinosin. I took one pellet of carcinosin Q1 and put it in four ounces of water in a bottle. 
And that was the medicinal solution for that patient. They dosed from that. Every time they dosed from that bottle, they succussed before they dosed. Any other questions? I think it's fair to say, Gregory, that the idea of treating C potencies like Q potencies, so to speak, is not um, is not new. I mean, it was it was pretty well written in the Paris case books, correct? That was one of the things that I was hoping to just throw in for a couple of minutes in our expanded webinar was to reference uh, uh, the potencies that Hahnemann had on hand. At, I have not seen his parents' casebook, so I can't speak directly, but I will um, uh, uh, describe a little bit of what David Little, uh, a homeopath that I've studied his work, because he has seen uh, some of the Paris casebooks, and, and Hahnemann treated the C potencies and the Q potencies uh, in medicinal solution no differently. He treated them, in other words, he administered them in the same way. <laughs> And Gillette asked, um, but what if you go to the second class? Do you see if the class and start with the new class and just start right. each time? You know, e each time I uh, make up, have the patient make up a new glass, they have to stir the solution before they take a dose from that glass. And then, so like, you know, that first glass that I just described with uh, uh, patient BM, uh, he, you know, I'll, I'll go through the process again. Uh, put one pellet of lycopodium 30C in four ounces of water in his bottle. And initially that was, you know, for the first month, that's what he was dosing from, was that, that four ounce bottle, right? Uh, after I found out he was having an aggravation, um, I decided to have him dose from the first glass and I had him, you know, so he, up to that point, you know, the same process up to the point of, but when he took the, his teaspoon out of the bottle, he puts that into a glass of four ounces of water and stirs and then takes a teaspoon from that glass, that first glass as his dose. You throw out the rest of the water in the glass, right? And so the next time he doses, he has to go from the bottle to the first glass and then to a second glass, stir, take the dose out of that second glass throughout the rest of the solution in the glass, right? So that each time he's making up, you know, each time he doses, let's say the second glass, or if he's dosing the third, third glass, he has to go through that process each time. You don't, you don't save what's left in the glass each time. You throw it out, you, you go through the same process each time, each day when you dose, or each, whenever you're dosing. Any anything else, anyone? Sue, do you want to make any comments? Any of the other attendees or panelists want to make any comments or questions? Well, I just want to say thank you all for uh, putting up with the technical difficulties uh, for this evening. Uh, and. Uh, if you do want to explore this further, uh, step by step in depth, then uh, please join me for uh, our class. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a, a useful course to integrate the methods into your practice. Uh, and I thank uh, the ABH uh, and, and Dr. Feynman and Dr. Beal here for being on the call tonight and helping out when um, uh, I, I couldn't get things to work from my end. Thanks, you guys. Oh, thank you, and uh, thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next month. And hopefully some of you will have already started Gregory's course, and we can talk about it then. So thank you, and the recording, the audio recording will be available after, after we're done. Thank so you. So we'll see you. Have good a good evening. evening. All right, bye-bye.